Hi, this is Miriam Guitellis with Painting with Kindergartners. First, a little bit about me. I've been teaching for 21 years. I am national board certified. I am special ed trained. I've been doing a uh, education blog now for about 12 years. You can also find my YouTube channel and I have a ton of art projects for both uh, students who speak English and Spanish. A lot of what I have learned, have actually learned when I worked at studio in a school in New York City. And I would say aside from both my grad programs, which I think were very helpful in helping me navigate the classroom. I think studio in a school above all have, has really helped me be an, uh, an arts educator. So I wanna start with the idea that a lot of times when we've been teaching for a while, we think we need to start teaching students new material, uh, fresh material that just because you know, we're bored with the material doesn't necessarily mean that it's not new to the students. So I think it's really important when you're working with five-year-olds to understand that they've never done some of these things. So it's always important that every year uh, you understand that they are coming to it fresh and new and they are so excited. So it's very important to just keep refocusing um, that onto them so that we are aware that um, although we might think the material is a little bit worn and think that we need to move on to something more sophisticated, it is still important to focus on the basics with five-year-olds. So I start really slow, like this little snail here has a long way to go. Um, when we do any kind of unit and painting, I start slow. Everything is super, super slow. Um, the reason for that is I really want them to learn the process. And um, at the end, the creativity will come, but it's the process of how we rinse brushes, how we, um, how we do, specific things where we walk with our wet art, etc. One of the things I found helpful was sponges as far as how to clean. Um, a lot of teachers have their students line up to wash their hands at a sink. I have them staying in their chairs and I walk around with a bucket full of water and I squeeze out the sponges before handing it to them. And then I walk around again and give them a new squeezed out sponge in return for their dirty one. And we continue that way until they have a completely um, clean hand to clean tables. Um, I put the picture of these uh, sponges here because they are sort of these um, packing material that come with Fruit of the Month Club. And I have found that those sponges above all other sponges have actually retained their shape and are easily washed in the washing machine and I've kept them for years. And I'm not kidding. So I think if you can find any families who can donate these fruit of the month packing materials, um, you are in good hands. This is very directly connected to a studio in a school, starting with very basic colors. So I, I do introduce the primary colors and I do not talk about how to mix these colors. I am very excited when they discover that when they layer these colors together, they do get a new color. And the first time we start painting, it's always just with those two colors or with just one color, maybe black and white. And to see that when you mix two colors, they do, do mix. Now notice the palette on the left of the child is clean, which means yellow is still yellow and the red is still yellow, red. Another reason to start with just two colors is you want them to learn how to rinse their brushes before dipping it into the new color. And that is very important because I do use these palettes over and over again for separate classes. I don't pour out new paint for each class. So that is one very important lesson that I focus on with the first couple of days of painting. And if they are unable to maintain these palettes clean, I will focus my efforts on that specific child so that they do learn how to do this. Learning how to rinse your brush correctly is another thing that's really important. I teach them to put some pressure on the brush so that the bristles are spread out at the bottom of the jar. I prefer these jars that are clear 
and are wide bottomed. So if you have any families that wanna donate recycled materials, this is an excellent item to ask for because it gives kids a really clear window to what exactly happens in the water when those two colors mix. One thing I wanted to mention was that students are very preoccupied with what happens in the cup. And that is completely okay and normal. And to allow for the kids to be able to talk about what happens and have them uh, discuss with each other. At this point, when you're doing this, the kids are incredibly focused and uh, engaged. Notice they have a paper that's 18 by 12 inches. This is a perfect deal for a five-year-old. It pretty much covers their whole torso in front of them and it keeps the table clean. Not to say that they are not gonna paint the table, um, but they will, it does help maintain most of the uh, artwork on the paper. Notice their brushes are fairly small and uh, that is exactly how you want to start the exploration process. I do use a ratio of big paper and small brushes for little ones because it still provides students with the ability to see what happens when the colors are mixed without the extra mess. And I do only have kids for about half an hour or 35 minutes at most. So uh, it's important that they do get the experience of mixing, but that the cleanup time is minimized because of the large paper and small brush. In my classroom, I only buy six colors. These are my favorite types of uh, paints. I think they're called Versatemps from um, School Specialty. And I do use egg cartons as my palettes. And I do use them over and over and over again until a weekend comes. And then they, of course, are going to dry off or I'm unable to maintain them moist until the next day. The palettes are pretty much kept clean because we do, as I said, work very slowly in learning to uh, correctly rinse our brushes and that way our paint palettes remain the same or the cleanliness wise and other students are able to use the same palettes as they come to the next class. So this also saves me on time. I don't have to refill the palettes. Um, I only fill them as necessary and each palette only has six colors. Now, I do have a separate video in my channel talking about how you can make up to 39 different colors using just this palette you see here on the left. So um, it, I do keep, this is my system of paint and I have been using this same system for um, about 10 years now. So here are my plastic and styrofoam egg cartons. When I get them from the families as donations, I do cut them up and store them in half because that is how I use them in the classroom. Uh, notice that students are really preoccupied with these little mixings. And a lot of your initial paintings are going to be students just mixing and mixing and mixing new colors and that is absolutely normal. And um, they become pretty adept at mixing colors and without knowing that they're doing it, creating secondary, even tertiary colors on demand. Here is um, what I would call a second lesson. Because there are three primary colors, I will have them repaint their paintings so I will have them write their names on the back. When they come back the next time, they will get a two new primary colors until we've covered all three. So in three sessions, we have painted over the same paper and they get to realize that they can layer their paints and paints are layerable. And it also teaches them the one aspect of painting with tempera and acrylics and other types of paints, not watercolors, that that paints can be layered and that time plays a, a very important aspect in painting because, uh, because you weighed it, now you can layer a new color on top and something different happens, which is it won't mix with the color underneath. Here are kids at different stages. 
they probably had a red and yellow the first day and today they have maybe blue and red and so they're making a couple of purples when i do give them blue and red as their day i will add a little white to the blue because the um the purple they get is a lot more satisfying. Now, the benefit of giving them their same painting to paint over several days in a row is that they then realize they can layer and detail. So this is another opportunity to also switch around your brushes and maybe give them smaller brushes so that they can add details on top and they could realize that they're, they can adorn their painting. Because a lot of the kids, when they first start out, they think, um, if I just fill the paper, my painting is done. But in fact, if you fill the paper and it dries the next day, the whole paper now is, um, is, is able to be quote decorated or layered. So here you'd see this child is adding some dots to their painting using a, a thinner brush than they had the day before. Now, this child is at a stage where she is just exploring all the different colors she can make. And notice her palette is, I say, about 90% clean, which is, you, is achievable for five-year-olds to maintain a clean palette. Again, I pretty much stay on top of a child if they do paint, if they do start mixing, they do this thing where they're dipping their brushes in every color. Once they do that, I'll take it away and we and I'll sit beside them and we will practice rinsing their brushes so that they understand that it's important to keep their palettes clean. So not only will it be easier for you as an educator to not have to report paint for the next class, but that they understand that they don't waste the paint as well. When they get older, by the way, I do teach them how to accumulate the paint in a, a newspaper or a piece of glossy magazine paper so that they can mix them. And we call those mixing papers. So I do you allow them to kind of create their colors in a different place once they get older. It's just for kindergarten, I just have them mix it straight on the paper. Again, another child who's still at that stage of just mixing colors and notice all these secondary and tertiary colors created by just those primary colors. This is a second day or third day. Um, at the end of them exploring, mixing yellow, blue, blue, red, and red, yellow, I will start adding in whites and black. And so our, our unit will just keep going, basically. The last uh, part of this unit usually involves them getting a brand new piece of paper and all the colors. And I think this is one of those pictures. Again, detailing happening over a dry painting. So the kids do work on their paintings for several days, up to three or four days. And they don't protest because I think after they might protest the first day that they're getting their paintings back. But once they see the results of the layering, they find it very satisfying. So here, I believe it's just the child only has blue and red. So this must be, I think, their third day where they're mixing those colors. What one, some of the kids have found, though, that is if they re-wet the color that's underneath, especially with tempera, they're able to rewaken the color and um, allowing for a whole new set of opportunities with mixing. So they do understand that it's the color will sit on top of the other color if it's if the bottom color is dry. But if they're able to use water to re-wet the bottom color, it will remix with the new wet color. So again, a lot of a lot of discoveries are happening, and there's very little work I'm doing besides walking around and making sure that they're not eating the paint. So there's a lot going on um, and they're fully, fully engaged during this time. As you notice with all my pictures, all the students are wearing smocks. And for me, smocks are just large adult size t-shirts that I will spend time teaching them how to put them on. Uh, for all kindergartners, we do 
do a full lesson at the beginning of how we walk into our t-shirts by laying the t-shirt face down on the table and how we crawl inside and open our arms and then put our heads through. Um, this allows us to save a lot of time because if I were to put a t-shirt on every child in a 35 minute class, we would not have time to paint. Um, I also want you to notice with this photo that the painting is so dynamic and exciting and there's just so many things going on in there. And that, that um, the fact that we use time to our advantage and allowed each exploration period to uh, dry and then have them come back to it really does allow for that. Here are some other um, kindergarten paintings. These are obviously so wet. This has, is one of my favorite, favorite paintings. Um, it's just so many things going on in here. Look at all the secondary and tertiary greens um, colors going on and again, only primary colors, only three colors were used to make this painting. Here again, I think we started using, um, after I give them the three primary colors, I will then add white. And that adds a whole new out of the level of mixing possibilities. Notice I also never tell them what to paint. Students come ready to paint whatever it is that they are excited about and that is perfectly acceptable. They're welcome to share it with me when I come around. Here is another painting with, of course, um, there's lots of detailing on top. Now I'm gonna move on to watercolors. Again, I'm not actually sitting there teaching color mixing or uh, about evaporation, for example. A lot of this learning happens just incidentally, just from them being involved in the lesson. So, um, and I find that that kind of learning is a lot more valuable, a lot, it lasts a lot longer. Um, of course, later on, you might wanna go ahead and put names to those concepts that they already know instinctually but definitely I will not sit there and bore five-year-olds with uh, the color wheel. So we start with watercolors again, how to treat the palette, look at that beautiful palette and how to keep it clean. And um, they of course get a gorgeous watercolor brush. And we talk about how to use the brush like a spoon to bring water to the sleeping color. And we call the color in the palette sleeping because it's not wet. And then we create a little puddle and then we mix the color and now we woke up the color. So, um, and we do a lot of explorations. Uh, I will use a document camera to show how I pre-paint the colors. And um, again, I also have a science of watercolor video in my YouTube channel, which you're welcome to look at. It has a lot more information about how exactly I will demonstrate some of these concepts. And again, I will introduce them to just a few simple uh, ways to explore with watercolor and then they will go to town and explore on their own. Notice the papers are really small, partly because watercolor paper is very expensive, but also I just wanted to contain it. There's a certain sense of satisfaction with finishing up the paper and with watercolor, because it's so absorbent, a lot of times if it's a larger paper, there's a certain sense that you didn't finish or that it looks unfinished at the end. Um, so the paper size will correspond directly with how much time you have. Now, if I had an hour with these kids, I would give them maybe a nine by 12, but because this is a 35 minute class and I probably spent about 15 minutes going over some of these um, concepts in my first class, and this is their exploration, I do need to give them a smaller piece of paper. Here's another child exploring and notice how the colors are running. Um, there's a lot of just a complete engagement. Kids are really excited about what happens if. Here a child picked up his painting and is uh, tilting it and watching the color run 
and as it's running on the paper, is also painting it. Here, a child is making lots of lines by using an overly wet brush with loaded with paint and seeing what happens when she tilts the paper. These are just some other examples of exploration. And we do work with drops. You know, we start working with like loading the brush with drops and putting those drops on the paper. And then maybe if we wanna mix another drop and keeping it with the whole concept of drops also allows it to be really, really uh, clean, clean and easily cleaned at the end. They do learn a lot about water and the, and the properties of water, just again, naturally. So um, there's a lot of science lessons in there. And then they also learn the, about layering and um, what, is, what are some of the effects of layering, especially with watercolors, obviously. And last, they learn about the effects of time on watercolor and how the water that is <clears throat> looking so wet on the surface of the paper tomorrow is going to be dry. And we do focus on that too at the next class. There's a lot of assessments that are happening with, um, with painting. One of my assessments that I have is after our, let's say for a month long, our month long painting unit with Uptempera, we will have students create a rainbow using those three colors. So what this asks of a five-year-old is that they will mix the primary colors to create the secondary colors and put these colors in order. I know this sounds super simple for a grown adult or even uh, an older elementary child, but for a five-year-old, these are, uh, this is a very challenging task, but there's something really, um, it's kind of a sweet spot for five-year-olds because it is challenging, but also the results are just so beautiful. So I think their stick to um, always um, comes out in the end. And I'm always amazed at how gorgeous these assessments are. So here you notice the child made an orange with red and yellow for the, for the orange and then yellow and then made their own green from those primary colors in the palette. Sometimes the students will use an empty hole in the palette for mixing colors. And I will dissuade that from them because um, in the future, I will allow them to use um, magazine paper to mix their colors. Um, the only reason is because I do use these palettes over and over and over again with about my, my four or five classes during the day. So it's important that they learn how to keep them clean. But in their own home, if they're painting, obviously they can use um, those empty um, spaces to mix colors. Um, I do teach them about brush size by just using one color. And this I learned from my special ed training when you're assessing one thing, you know, make it nice and clean and um, simple. And so here I wanted to teach them uh, thick, middle and thin lines and how to use one brush to achieve that. So we looked at trees and trees are really easy. They have a really thick trunk. They have um, thinner branches and then they have really thin twigs. So we use brushes and we talked about how artists use brushes in different ways. And they also choose different brushes for different purposes. Um, we do use a lot of visual resources and they are varied and the purpose of offering varied visual resources is so that they can um, feel really good about their results because all their results will actually look very different and that is okay. So this is day two or three on our cherry blossom uh, trees and notice the differences in all these trees. They're all incredibly beautiful in their own way. And um, sometimes depending on what supplies I have, I'll have them use a stamp for um, the cherry blossoms where in which they mix a stamp, meaning like a cork top maybe, or cork in which they dip in white or red 
to create pinks. And then the third day would be use oil pastels to add other details such as grass and flowers and uh, birds and clouds and so on. There's so many good ways to go through this. But again, the emphasis here is their uh, own interests. I mean, whatever they draw on the ground is up to them. They can draw insects, flowers, grass. There is um, numerous opportunities for them to individualize their work. Again, here is, a, uh, look how different everyone looks. These are, um, they do have some visual resources there. But again, all their, all their work is unique. They were able to achieve thick, medium, and thin lines. And so in, in essence, all of, all of what they do is being looked at and assessed. You, we also work with paint to create texture. And this is less of a mixing color exercise than it is to see, um, to learn about texture and all the different types of textures we can create with paint. Uh, and again, we're using time to um, learn that once the paint dries, it will feel a certain way or it will look a certain way. This was part of our Eric Carl unit and we painted different papers in and then we textured them with different colors and then we sorted them and cut them. Uh, we put them in a shopping area in baskets and then they were able to use them to create um, uh, animals and their babies. So we read a book by Eric Carl called El Canguro Tiene Mama and it means does a kangaroo have a mom? And we created different animals with their parent and um, this is after a unit on drawing and how to combine shapes to uh, create animals. So they had a lot already in drawing. So they had a lot of skills that they have gained from our drawing unit in which they combine basic shapes to create recognizable animals and objects. So this came at the end of that. These are just some examples of the um, unit. Um, I do use a lot of recycled materials in the classroom and which is um, another way that you can have paint going on and layering. You can use this over two days. You can have them dry and come back and use different materials, different colors. It's really up to you. Notice the paper is quite large. It is double a um, 12 by 18, it's pretty big. These tend to be a little messier, so I will go big, I will give them bigger paper. Um, so we use all kinds of materials that parents might donate, tops, corks, um, wooden pieces. Oftentimes with these stamp projects, I will do a group work. And this one was one that we did with Swimmy. And so it was a really large piece of paper and they used blue and white to create light blue, which is a great color mixing unit. Then they used um, paint, white and blue paint. That was, we had these jars that they stuck in the paints to make these bubbles. And last they um, had created these orange fish or I gave them a shape. I'm not quite sure, but I know that we ended up using, doing this mural over three days. Now, the last purpose that I use paint for is to paint over drawings that they've done. And I tend to kind of stay away from that. It's only if at the end of the year, if I see, I see my kindergartners three times a week. So at the end of the year, I have used every, every uh, media. And so they've already done a lot. So we start thinking of other ways to include paint. And in this case, they all traced a quail because we had read a story about a quail and then they had painted. So in this case, they will trace, they will paint over stuff that they've traced or they've drawn. Um, this is another way I've used paint. In this case, I think we use the tempera cakes 
which offer more than the colors that I normally give them. But it's a good opportunity to review how to use watercolors, which are very similar to tempera cakes, especially in the way that you'd use them. So for example, here you would use, you would have them create a drawing and then paint inside. Um, but again, I, that is not my preferred way of working. It's usually, it's usually just at the end of the school year, we might have some things to do, but this is not really how I would teach painting. Another really fun project they love to do is folding the paper and painting one side to create a butterfly. And these are just some examples. This is the folding one. And this, I think they pre-drew. So you can tell the difference because they're not symmetrical. But this one, uh, they did paint on one side. You might have to slightly pre-draw the shape that they need to follow because I don't think they will know. And then they fill it in and then they fold it. And it just, it's almost addictive. Like you're gonna have to use copy paper at the end if you don't have enough paper because they just love this project. Um, I do a lot of sculptures in my classroom and we use paint to paint the sculptures. And I have a very specific way I do that. Notice this child is painting over a sculpture made out of cardboard and wood and cork. Here are some more examples of students working on their sculpture before we paint them. And sometimes if we have a fun color like silver or gold, I will just have them painted one color or we'll vote on it. Um, my general way of working with paint is having them choose a color to paint the entire sculpture first. And then on a second day, use a smaller brush and varied offerings of colors to create details. This one, I must've had silver and we went ahead and painted all of these silver and these were gold. Notice they're really solidly painted and for a five-year-old to solidly paint a sculpture this way, you would need to have it done twice. So you have the first day, put their smocks on, paint the entire thing with a thick brush, let it dry, come back the next day, you're doing the same thing. And they really enjoyed this. This is, um, it was just a great finished product for them. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope this was helpful for you to teach kindergartners with painting. If you have any questions, please include them in the comments. Don't forget, like this video. Thank you.